Thank you very much. Can you, can you hear me clearly at the back there? Yes? Yeah. Excellent. Uh, great. Have you um, had a great two days? I believe it's the first ever um, Inspires weekend. I've come and spoken over the years as a founding patron, and it's been fantastic. Um, and I believe this is the first time you've had two days of back-to-back -back entrepreneurship. And this is the last session, I'm told. Is that correct? Yeah. Excellent. Well, hopefully, hopefully, some of the messages that you've learned over these uh, past couple of days will come together in what I'm going to talk to you about. So I've been asked to speak for about 20 minutes or so, and then we'll have um, questions for long, as long as you want to ask me questions. Uh, any of you here heard me talk about the Cobra story before? Can I just see? Just let me see. Okay. So I'm not going to tell you the whole Cobra story. I'm just going to be pulling out some of the lessons from the Cobra story that relate uh, to the whole concept of entrepreneurship. And the title is very, very uh, appropriate in today's world with what we've been going through, uh, Adapt or Die. And a lot of the story is about that. It's not a smooth journey. Success is not uh, a destination. It is a journey. And it's a very, very bumpy, bumpy road. Uh, I was born and brought up in India. I came here when I was 19 years old for my higher education, uh, qualified as a chartered accountant with Ernst & Young. I realized within two years of that, I didn't want to be an accountant for the rest of my life, but a very good qualification, and I'm very proud of it, and I learned a lot from it. And I've had the experience, unlike many entrepreneurs, of actually working in a large global organization, which is great experience, um, because many entrepreneurs who go straight into business have never worked for another organization and do not know the whole environment of a giant business and all the office politics that goes with it and all the good things as well as the bad. Uh, and then I did a law degree at the other place. Um, and uh, we, uh, by the way, at the, I'm a member of the House of Lords now, and we always refer to the House of Commons as the other place. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and now, I did a course at the Harvard Business School. And I've, I've done, I'm an alumnus of three business schools through executive education, the Cranfield School of Management, the London Business School and the Harvard Business School. The Harvard Business School, I did the advanced management program called the President's Leadership Program, in my case, spread out over nine years. A week, a year for nine years. I'm a very slow learner. <laughs> <laughs> and the final year, uh, we had our, um, our main, our sort of rock star, as they call them, their lecture, and it was given by Professor Clay Christensen. Have any of you um, heard of Professor Clay Christensen? Yes? I mean, in the last, last uh, um, list of the 50 leading business thinkers in the world, he was number one. Great, great um, management guru. And he came into this talk. There were two sections of 90 each, 180 of us, in this large lecture hall. And he started a giant of a man, six foot eight. He said, please, would you bear with me during this lecture? It's the first talk I'm giving after a long time, because I fell very ill. I got cancer, and I beat the cancer, and then I got a stroke. <coughs> and I've just recovered from the stroke, and he said, you can see that I've got no problems with my movements, but it has affected me in one way. He said, when I speak, I find it difficult to find words sometimes. So in this lecture, if I'm struggling to find words, will you just shout them out? It'll save time. <laughs> you know, at the end of the lecture, he was in tears, and we were in tears. We had to shout out words several times during that lecture. But the two messages that he conveyed at the end of that talk, I will never forget all my life. Two messages, very, very simple. First message, and a lot of it came from the time he spent here at Oxford. He was also at Harvard. First message is, have you ever thought, what is the purpose of your life? Can you just honestly think about that for a second? How many of you have honestly thought what the purpose of your life is? That's great. I mean, if you've done that, fantastic. Because I can tell you, when I was your age, I hadn't, <laughs> I hadn't even thought about it. I was just getting on with the next step and the next step and the next step. And the link to that is how will you measure your life? Will it be the millions of pounds that you're going to earn? Will it be being a successful parent? Will it be the good you do in the world? Will it be becoming president or prime minister, whatever. I don't know, how will you measure, measure your life? Just think about that. Um, 
an entrepreneurial journey. You know, what is entrepreneurship? Why do people do it? And it is not easy. A lot of it is aspiring to get somewhere. A lot of it is being inspired by somebody, by people to get there. And there's no, no shortcut to that bottom part. It's just bloody hard work. And there's really, really no shortcut to that. Um, it's invariably against all the odds. When I started, I was asked just before we started, um, did you really start from nothing? Did, you know, when I tell people that I created Cobra Beer, they say, what? No, 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 no. Cobra Beer must have been around for hundreds of years. <laughs> you know, I, I've, I've met. I met British Army officers, retired British Army officers who served in India. I mean, they're very old now. Uh, I remember Cobra before the war <laughs> in India. Delicious beer. Didn't exist. Yeah. Um, and Kingfisher, which is the biggest beer brand in India by mile, even today, 50% of beer sold in India is by United Breweries, Kingfisher's owners, had been in the UK for eight years before we started. Carlsberg was in every Indian restaurant before we ever started. I had no money. Our first company car was a Citroen de Chevaux called Albert. I borrowed 295 pounds from my partner. I had a business partner, started together, and we bought this car. And it's a battered, bright green Citroen de Chevaux. And when I now point out the Citroen de Chevaux to my children, I say, that was my first car, company car. They joke, they know you couldn't have driven a car like that, Daddy, you know. And it was very special because it needed push starting every day. I'm not exaggerating any of this. And if you looked down while you were driving, you could see the road through the holes in the floor of the car. And it would take exactly 15 cases of Cobra if you put them in the front seat, the back seat, and the boot. And we'd you know, drive a little bit ahead of the restaurants to uh, deliver the beer because we didn't want them to see the delivery vehicle of the most expensive ever Indian beer. So it's really tough. I mean, two of us against all this. I had student debt to pay off from having too good a time at Cambridge. Um, and no one thinks you have a st have stand a chance. That's the other thing. If I conducted, those of you who are already at business school will have learned about Porter's Five Forces Market Entry Analysis. Yeah, how many of you have done that? You know all about it. I would have failed all five. Um, your family, who you think are going to be really supportive, who have encouraged you all your life to do well at school and do well at university, tell you don't do it. Don't go into business. You're going to fail. And of course, you don't stand a chance. If you actually look at it, you don't stand a chance. My own father became commander in chief of the Central Indian Army. 350,000 people under his command. When I used to go up from Bangalore developing the beer, and I'd take a break to see my father, I knew he would never give me any money because he had no money. I mean, Indian Army officers got paid so badly. He said in my wedding speech, I never had to dissuade my sons from joining the army. All I did was show them my paycheck. <laughs> so I knew no money from dad. I thought at least a bit of encouragement, moral support, emotional support. You must be joking. What are you doing? <laughs> all this education and you're becoming an import export voila <laughs> get a proper job <laughs> become a banker great profession great profession anyway, um, so you know and of course they're doing it because they care for you and the reality is that most businesses fail that's the reality of course, once Cobra succeeded, he was my greatest supporter. <laughs> um, this is something with entrepreneurship, overcoming the credibility gap. You all, how many of you have a business idea? Yeah, fantastic. How many of you have already started your business idea? You actually put it in practice. Okay, now maybe you can identify with this. You started your business idea. You've got this great idea. It could be a product, brand, innovation, whatever it is. You're going out there. You're young. I mean, I was in my 20s when I started. Nobody knows you. Nobody knows your product. Nobody knows your brand. You have zero credibility. In my case, I had no money, and I knew nothing about beer other than drinking it. I didn't know how to make it. I'd never sold a bottle of beer in my life. Why should people, when you're in that position, buy from you, supply from you, finance you? And they do that if you have complete passion, faith, confidence, belief in your idea and in yourself, in your brand. And that gives them the faith to trust you, to give you a chance. 
and I call it bridging the credibility gap. And the best example I can think of is when I shipped the first container of Cobra beer brewed and bottled in Bangalore in India. I didn't have the money to pay for the beer. The owner of the brewery lent me the money to pay him for the beer. <laughs> That's how powerful, because he believed in me. And he knew that we were going to succeed, and he had faith in me. And to this day, even though we don't do any business together, we're great family friends. Um, branding is very, very important. Whatever your business, and again, nowadays in the internet world and the digital world, people think, oh, my business is B2B, and I therefore don't need to worry about branding. Branding is only for fast-moving consumer goods. No, branding is for anything that you do. If you're a politician, you're into brands. You're a brand. Whatever you do, you're into brands. And I think brands are very, very important, very, very powerful, whatever your business. Of course, with a consumer brand like ours, it's even more powerful. This is our first ever advertising campaign, uh, which Saatchi and Saatchi worked with us to create with our spokesperson, Curry Holic Dave. My name's Dave, and I'm a Curry Holic, and it's uh, the beer from Bangalore that lets you eat more curry, the beer Curry Holics adore, lets them eat more, the less gassy, more classy Curry Holics beer, and you could go on. This was a great, great success, and really established Cobra as the best beer to drink with Indian food. Today, we are 98% of the Indian restaurants in the UK. There are 10,000 Indian restaurants in the UK, of which almost 7,000 are licensed to sell alcohol, and we're 98% of those licensed outlets. And this did a lot to help us establish ourselves as the best beer to drink with Indian food. Today, we are nearly five times bigger than Kingfisher in the UK, and they started eight years before we did over here. Sorry, I'm boasting a bit. I hope you don't mind. <laughs> uh, how many of you think you're creative? Please. I will hope every hand goes up, you know, because I was told throughout my childhood, you are not creative. Why? Because I was useless at art. I couldn't draw. I still can't draw. Therefore, you're not creative. And all my childhood, all my school days, all my university days, I went through with this mindset that I was not creative. I was good at my studies. I was good academically. I did well. I'm not creative. What nonsense. I realized when I started my business, my biggest strength was the ability to be creative. The most powerful thing is the ability to be creative, especially as an entrepreneur. And isn't it ironic that in accountancy, the word creative is negative, creative accounting? So creativity, really important. And here's an example. And there's no end to creativity, by the way. Obviously, your advertising and stuff is creative. But even when you get to your packaging, when we repackaged our beer about 10 years ago, we did this, just under 10 years ago. And we said to the top design agency in Britain at the time, come up with a different beer bottle. Something, and they said, look, we're really struggling because the key to Cobra beer is its extra smooth, less gassy taste. How do we convey that as packaging? What do we do, show bubbles or don't show bubbles? <laughs> All we can do is say, extra smooth. And you do that anyway. I said, come on, work harder, come up with a solution. And then they got their inspiration from Roman and Greek and Persian columns that tell story in a frieze. Do you know what I'm talking about? And they said, what is so special about this beer is that in a very, very short time for a beer brand, it's become a household name in this country. And they decided to tell the story of Cobra beer using icons embossed on the bottle. Never been done for a consumer product ever in the world before. And it's become now a really iconic bottle, and every one of the symbols has a meaning behind it. So this is how you can be really creative and just even with packaging, not just with your advertising and communications. Uh, I have my eight Ps of building a business. Uh, those of you who studied marketing, you know the four Ps, yeah? It incorporates the four Ps. So, uh, first P is the product. So whatever your business, you've got to obviously come up with your product. Now, your product, in our case, very, very clear, the differentiation. You've got to have something, in my view, that's different and better and changes the marketplace forever. Uh, I mean, I'll give you, in our case, it's that 
creating a beer that tastes in between a lager and an ale and has a refreshment in lager and a smoothness of an ale combined so it's really smooth and easy to drink and refreshing and goes well with all food, in particular curry, and appeals to everyone and has a globally appealing taste. That's, well, I mean, you know, ales can be very lovely, which I love. How many of you drink real ale? Yeah, I love the stuff. <laughs> Try drinking it with, with, with food. It's too heavy, it's too bitter. Some of the lagers can be too gassy. So creating this beer that's got the combination has really worked. It's the, it's the secret to Cobra's success. But nobody thought of that before in an industry that's thousands of years old. Look at Facebook, the extreme example of it. When Facebook was started 10 years ago, MySpace was already there. Social networking was very well established. He just did it in a way that was different and better and has changed the marketplace forever. So whatever you do, if you can do it different and better, is I think the key to the product. You don't have to invent something that never existed before, is my, my, my bottom line. Price, you, you know, depends on your product. Ours is a premium product, it's expensive. If you look on the shelves in, in the supermarkets, you will see Cobra is invariably one of the more expensive beers. That's our price positioning. It could be a value for money. Our, our wine brand, which I do as a hobby, which I named after my father, General Billamoria Wines, he never charged me a royalty. And that is a budget premium house wine. So that's got a value for money price positioning. Place, there's no point having a great product if it's not available. In our case, the strategy was to go from Indian restaurants to the supermarkets to the pubs and bars. So our next stage of expansion is the pubs and the bars where we don't have much distribution at this stage. Promotion, I touched on the advertising, the branding, marketing, PR. Um, in the early days, we couldn't ad afford advertising, so public relations was a big part of our, our business and still is. Um, Richard Branson's the king of that, and integrated marketing, and, and it's sales and marketing. Okay, those are the four P's of, mar of marketing. I've covered them. These are my extra four. People. You've got to, got to build up a great team. For a start, those of you who put your hands up saying you started your business, how many of you started with a partner? Okay, right. Um, I wonder how many of those partnerships will last. I hope they last, but they don't always last. I started with my business partner. I could not have done it on my own. And Arjun Reddy and I, to this day, great friends. But he left. He didn't think the brand was going to take off. He didn't really believe in it. And he hated the weather here. So he <laughs> went back to India, and now he's in the States. And, and you know, he's doing what he loves doing. And uh, all I can say is I could not have started without him. But I do know that most business partnerships, or a lot of them, do not endure. You know, Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, <laughs> um, you, know, you could go on, they don't always uh, endure. Richard Branson started with a partner. And then you build up a team. And building up a fantastic team is the secret. Apart from getting your product right, is this, is getting the most amazing people. And I could talk to you for hours about the wonderful people I've had by my side. One of my senior directors has going to complete 20 years with me in May this year, and I would not be, have been able to succeed without his support, especially through the hard times by my side. Um, people also, by the way, includes your family who can support you in this journey, because it's a really tough journey. And um, finance, spelt P-H, <laughs> you, you can't do anything without the money. And again, I could talk to you for hours. One of the most difficult things when you're starting a business is to raise the money especially if you want to hold on to your equity. And I give whole lectures based on raising finance for growing businesses and keeping a broad mind and raising money from not just overdrafts and equity, but all the other things that exist in between. And nowadays, there's so much available as well. Um, passion. I really, really believe you've got to be passionate about what you do. It makes all the difference. I mentioned that in the credibility gap. And uh, profit. <coughs> and this is one of the mistakes that we made is we sacrificed our profit for growth. We made very good gross profit, but we sacrificed our bottom line profit, plowed it all back for growth. And I think there's a balance to be struck, and I think actually with hindsight, it's better to be really profitable and prove your profitability <coughs> than to sacrifice your profitability for growth. And there is one more P that I could add, um, and, and a sort of eight plus one, and that P would be plan and strategy. Again, that's a whole topic in itself, to have a strategy. Um, and we can, in the Q&A, if you want to ask me about that, we can, we can talk about that. Okay. This is now more and more, it always has been the case, about 
the principles and, and, and now people are demanding it, the customers are demanding it. This whole corporate social responsibility area was a cliched thing, a sort of thing that companies started to do a few years ago because they had to tick that box. Now it's an expectation. You know, ethics was not taught at Harvard Business School <laughs> until very recently. Uh, it, it, it's now becoming compulsory in many business schools, the whole topic of ethics. And when we started the Cobra Foundation, our own charity, in 2005, we discovered how small, small, small fraction of companies in Britain have their own charitable foundations. And we've supported charities from, from day one, and I'm very proud of that. Um, Great Recession, nobody predicted it. Well, one or two did, but uh, the Queen went to the London School of Economics to, to open this building a couple of years ago, and she met all these economics professors and said, why didn't any of you see this coming? And of course, we didn't. We were hit by it very badly. We formed a joint venture in 2009 when I nearly lost the whole business. It was dire. I mean, it was so bad, we were this close to losing the whole lot. And we saved the business and, st and started a joint venture with Molson Coors, one of the world's largest brewers. They own the biggest brewery in the world outside Denver. They own the biggest brewery in Britain, in Burston-on-Trent, where we brew Cobra. Giant brewers. And one of the reasons why the joint venture is working so well is because although they're a big multi-billion dollar global company and we're a small entrepreneurial company that have merged together, uh, the cultures have been quite similar in values and family values because of the largest family-owned brewers in the world. Uh, and, and that's very powerful when you have the two cultures uh, working side by side. It's a, it's a long-term joint venture, 10-year joint venture, so I've got another six years to go and then we can buy each other out or carry on forever. Um, when we signed the joint venture with Molson Coors, they said to us, we want to do this because A, you, Karen, yes, we believe in you as the founder, we want you to stay. Secondly, obviously, we believe in the product but also you have what, what we classify as an extraordinary brand. And so they said there's six things to, to tick, six boxes for an extraordinary brand. One is it has to tell a compelling story based on an undeniable brand truth. In our case, the extra smooth, less gassy taste, that's the undeniable brand truth. And here they've given the example of, of Guinness. Live by and refuse to compromise on their principles. In our journey, we've gone through horrible, horrible times, but we've managed to get through the three times I've nearly lost my business every time we've got through because of our integrity and because of our principles. The third is to have an instantly recognizable iconic look. Well, you saw that with our bottle, which I showed you earlier on. The example here is Absolute Vodka. Fourth is to deliver a unique, relevant, and consistent experience. So given the example of Starbucks, you know, it bugs me that wine, you know, with wines, you have different vintages. You can have 100 pound bottle of wine that will taste different one year and taste different the next year. Oh, it's fine, it's different vintage. And yet, with your bottle of Cobra, you will expect that every bottle tastes exactly the same every time. And it's a natural process, and we have to brew it naturally with natural ingredients. And the difficulty to make sure it's consistent and taste every single time is a real challenge, but no one appreciates that. Um, five, that inspire people to become loyal brand champions. And this is very, very important where, you know, you've got to f almost have a cult following, which, which we have built up with Cobra. And of course, they deliver enduring and extraordinary profits. Today, Cobra is the most profitable brand within the Molson Coors, whole, the whole business globally, it is the most profitable brand. Okay, I'm going to conclude by giving you, sharing two lots of lessons with you. Have any of you heard Guy Kawasaki speak? Any hands up here? Have any of you heard him speak about these lessons from Steve Jobs? No? One person, okay. Um, he worked with him for 10 years, and these are his lessons of working with Steve Jobs for 10 years, okay? So first, experts are clueless. Yeah, and it's so true, you know, you can work with the best experts, but you know your business better than anybody else as the entrepreneur. And I always feel one should be able to challenge your experts and work with them. Um, Customers cannot tell you what they want. Why? If I'd asked a customer about beer, they would have said, oh, I want a beer like Carlsberg, or I want a beer like Budweiser, or I want a beer like my favorite ale. They wouldn't have told me about a beer like Cobra. Quite often, you as an entrepreneur have to come up with the idea yourself. Uh, the classic example of Henry Ford, and, and you know, if he'd ask customers then, what do you want, a faster horse? Not a car. Um, innovation means jumping the curve. This is the most powerful lesson that I learned 
Brom guy when he's working with, with Steve Irwin. This example he gave was fantastic. If you take the example of ice, you know ice that we put in our drinks? A hundred years ago, ice was made by going with sledges into a, in winter to a lake, chopping a big block of ice, putting it on the sledge, bringing it back into the village, chopping that into little pieces and selling it. Then technology enabled ice factories in the middle of the village that made big blocks of ice, and they chop up the ice and sell it. And then technology developed, and you could make refrigerators so people could make ice in their own homes. The catch is the people who used to go on the sledges to get the ice didn't open the ice factories, and the people who opened the ice factories didn't open the refrigerator factories. Each time they got left behind. How can you as a company stay ahead of the curve through innovation? And Apple is the best example with the Apple computer to the Mac to the iMac to the iPod to the iPhone to the iPad, and it's all in one company. Absolutely phenomenal. Um, the biggest challenge is bring out the best work from your employees. I know this. Um, design counts. And of course, the designer of Apple, Jonathan Ives, is a Brit. And we've got fantastic design in this, in this country. Uh, changing your mind is a sign of intelligence. I keep telling the government this, especially George Osborne. You know, that's how he U-turned on pasty taxes. Well, he should do some more U-turns, but anyway, that's another topic. Um, value does not equal price. And this is the whole thing. This is so powerful depends on what you are creating and what you believe your product is. Um, uh, a players hire A plus players. This is completely counter because most people are threatened to hire people who are better than they are. The trick is to constantly hire people who are better than you are. And branding is not just something that's different, but it's also got to create value as well. So it's uniqueness and value. And the last thing is some things need to be believed to be seen. And of course, particularly bankers want everything in bricks and mortars. <laughs> they want to see it to believe it. Um, so this I found very, very powerful. And this is our vision, to aspire and achieve against all odds with integrity. And I think this is almost a definition of entrepreneurship. This is where you come up with an idea. You want to get somewhere with the idea. You've got all the odds stacked against you. You've got no means or little means. And you go out there and you do it. And you do it with integrity. And this is the final slide, which is what do successful entrepreneurs have in common? This is Matthew Rock, who is the editor of Real Business Magazine, who's in, interviewed more, um, he's interviewed more entrepreneurs than just about anybody, from Bill Gates to all of them. And he said, I wanted to try and find some common traits between all these entrepreneurs. And he produced a list of what he found was, was the commonality between all these different great entrepreneurs, including Bill Gates, that he had interviewed. And these are his, his common traits. One. They have this amazing, amazing self-belief in themselves and in their ideas. And some of this is going to resonate with some of the things I've been talking to you about just now. So think about that credibility gap. One single core technical skill. So some of them are great engineers like James Dyson or great techies and, and IT like Bill Gates. Not always. Some of them are all-rounders. Um, high levels of personal energy. And that's a fact. As I said, it's really hard work. Unafraid to talk about money. <laughs> um, they're very proactive. They'll not wait for things to happen. They will actually go out and make things. Well, that's entrepreneurship for a start. You've got to go out and do it. Um, at the right moment, they love to party. And I've seen this time and again with entrepreneurs, especially in the Young President's organization. Um, they are charismatic. A lot of them are very charismatic. Even Bill Gates is this ultimate geek. But he's, when you see him, when you meet him, he's a very, very charismatic individual. Um, very competitive. Entrepreneurs tend to be extremely competitive. Uh, they have, and this is an, one characteristic that I found, that they're the ones who have the guts to stick it out. They're the ones that have the guts when they fall to pick themselves back up. They have the guts to carry on when everyone else would give up. Um, they absolutely love what they do. And this is, um, and have a complete belief in it. And they have a, such a belief in their business that sometimes it's, it's unfathomable where they think they've got the best thing in the world, even when they absolutely don't. But that belief can make them power through with sometimes against all the odds, often against all the odds to make it. So that's 
Matthew Rock's What Do Successful Entrepreneurs Have in Common? That's it. So I think we've got one more thing to show you, and then I'll take some questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, I was just wondering, you said that um, a core technical skill is often necessary for an entrepreneur. So do you feel that for you it was your accounting background that was the technical aspect of what you brought into your role? OK, the question was um, uh, one of uh, Matthew Rock's thing was having traits of an entrepreneur have one core competence. I'm not so sure about that because I I think the more of an all-rounder you can be, the better. And I think that, uh, of course, having an accountancy background is useful, being able to read balance sheets while you're sleeping. And you know, I mean, it is, it is handy to be familiar with figures. But on a serious note, the professional environment of working in a large accounting firm, the, the, the emphasis on continual professional training, the ability to go into customers, putting customers first the whole time, the whole concept of customers, when you're working within organizations. Uh, a lot of that's really key. But I think the ability to sell is probably the most important skill that you can have in any business. Uh, and, and you know that ability to, scale, to sell, they don't teach in any business school. It's actually looked down upon. Uh, to, and, and this is a matter of time, I think, because business schools were looked down upon. Harvard started over 100 years ago. Uh, Cambridge started in the 1990s. This business school just started over 20 years ago. Uh, and at Cambridge, by the way, until only recently, Trinity College started letting in business school students into <laughs> admitting them as, into the college. Otherwise, they had to go to some, one of the other colleges. You know, there's this whole snobbishness about business is not absolutely wrong. Uh, and the same way selling is still not taught. And I think the ability to sell is one of the most important skills you have in life. Uh, politicians, is not, they need to be able to sell as well. So. Yes. Hi. Um, I just had two questions. Uh, first one is, how did you come up with the idea of, for your beer? And the second one is, we've heard a lot about you know, technical startup, tech startups. But w according to you, what is the biggest difference and challenges of having a non-tech startup? OK. Uh, how, I mean, I, I don't think that each business has its own challenges. Um, whether it's in, in, if it's a capital intensive business or it's a, nowadays with the tech startups, the best thing about them is that you can actually start your idea usually with very little, little resource. Uh, you can quite often do it with, with very little money to start off with, but the barriers to entry are also very low, so anyone can do it. That's the whole thing. And that's what makes it so competitive. Uh, and to come up with something that's different, come up with something that's better, when you're competing with millions of people who could do it and have access to it, makes it that much more difficult. Uh, again, but in the consumer space as well, it's very difficult to come up with a product and then put it into action, get it off the ground. And I've tried to share with you some of those, those lessons in, in, in building a business. In, in coming up with an idea, there is, in my case, it came from a consumer experience because I was dissatisfied with the lagers. I found them very gassy and fizzy. I loved the ales. And you're passionate about something, you hate something, and you see a gap in the market and a market in the gap. But of course, ideas aren't always a eureka moment. And even a eureka moment, you, have you all studied how the eureka moment works? You know, this whole concept of trying to crack a problem and you just can't do it. And then you go and have a bath. You don't think about it, and then you come running out of the bath naked, and that's my idea. You know, I mean, the, the, but the, the science in that is you often have to detach from what you're doing to actually come up with a solution. And I found that time and time again it, it works. Some of my best ideas come to me while I'm shaving or having a shower. Yeah, and, and I think if you, and the other thing is luck. There is a lot of luck that comes into this. They don't teach you that at business school, by the way. Uh, and, and you know, but they, what they do teach, one of the professors I worked with at Cambridge, he came up with the definition of the word serendipity. You know, we say something serendipity, oh, how fortuitous. He says serendipity is seeing what everyone else sees, <coughs> but thinking what no one else has thought. Think about it. And another friend, one of my friends defined luck, the best definition of luck that I've ever come across, is when determination meets opportunity. 
you're not determined, you will not see that opportunity. The opportunities keep coming. If you're determined, you will spot the opportunity. And there's so much luck that's come into, into my story. I mean, I, we don't have the time for it, but lots of luck. We have time for one more question. Two. Two. Okay. <laughs> um, I know uh, personal the personality of a founder is very important in, in a business. Um, for example, like for VJ Malia and United Breweries, his personality kind of, in, in, like, it's surrounded in, in the business. How important has your personality been in Cobra and defining the brand? I get asked this question about, you know, the, the, in, in entrepreneurship, how important is a founder to the business? There, there is a theory that entrepreneurs come up with the idea they have that ability to put that idea into action, marshal all these resources against all the odds, raise the finance, through the credibility gap, get it off the ground, and then they're hopeless managers and they can't run businesses, and they've got to either sell it on or bring in professionals to run it and move aside. And there are many entrepreneurs who are like that. Um, and they become serial entrepreneurs who go on from one to another to another, which is great. I, I, there's no right or wrong in this. Um, there are others who are entrepreneurs who carry on through the whole journey. So the Richard Branson's of this world who started with two people right at the beginning, and he's there right now, you can do it that way as well. And his personality, you know, how, how many of you, I just want a show of hands, to think that if Richard Branson suddenly decided to sell out of Virgin completely and have nothing to do with Virgin anymore, do you think it would carry on being as successful from here onwards? No. No. How many of you think it would be carry on being successful? Okay, prove just one, one or two hands, yeah? If I ask you the same question, do you think Apple would have been as successful without Steve Jobs? Yeah, do you think Microsoft would have been what it was without Bill Gates? Yeah, I, I really, it is so powerful. The, the founder can have such an important influence. And I believe even to this stage, Molson Coors, big global brewer, why do they need me? 225 year old business owning some of the biggest beer brands in the world, Coors Light, Carling. Why do they need me? Because they believe that the founder can still play a big role in helping the brand go forward. The only thing I say is I don't think I have an effect on the business because I hope nobody thinks about me when they're drinking a bottle of Cobra. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's one last question. Uh, so you, you mentioned that, uh, you know, like, which is the classic uh, learning that uh, the customers can't tell you what they need. Like, if you ask them, they tell you, I need a faster horse or that. Yeah. But there's also currently a lot of uh, thinking around that, you know, you should, if you're doing a startup, you should go very quickly to your customers and try and as, talk to your customers as much as possible and do a, maybe a minimum viable product. And so that, what do you think about that? that and there is a balance in this. So I, my belief is that first and foremost, again, we don't have the time, but it's a whole topic in itself which I learned very early on, which the Indian restaurateurs taught me. We wouldn't be where we are without, when I say Indians, by the way, Bangladeshis own more than 2,000 Indian restaurants here, Pakistanis, Sri Lankans, and please Indians. What the restaurateurs taught me, the lesson about being close to your customers and putting your customers first, that is for any business absolutely key. Uh, the point I was making is, that, and, and what the message from Steve Jobs is, the entrepreneur has to have that creativity quite often to come up with the ideas. You can come up with those ideas by being close to the customer that'll give you that idea, that'll make it emerge. But the one thing is important is never go forward with that idea without testing it with the consumer first. Uh, and that's where the consumer can be very good in telling you whether they like what you're doing or not. And that's where research can be very important. Big companies get it wrong because they, they go too research focused and they lose that entrepreneurial spark and creativity. And then the research quite often kills it because it is so analytical you lose that magic. And I think there's a balance between the two. So if I may just close by asking you two questions. That film that I showed you there, how many of you have seen it on TV? Because we've got a campaign on right now. Okay, thank you. Uh, it's a bit, those of you who are students, a bit of a difficult question to ask because if you put your hands up, that means you should be studying, you shouldn't be watching TV. <laughs> and how many of you have, have been to India? It's a matter of interest. Okay, if you haven't, go there, it's fantastic. Now, if I may, I will just, close talking about India with paraphrasing my, and this actually with entrepreneurship is, 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 is so powerful. My favorite quote of Mahatma Gandhi's, and this is my version of it, so I'm not telling you word for word. And this is my favorite quote of Mahatma Gandhi. It is that 
your, 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 your thoughts become your words. Your words become your actions. Your actions become your habits. Your habits become your character. And your character determines your destiny. Wish you all the very best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.